how to confess and the redemption that comes from confessing those sins. He's laying out his plan for Israel, and they're being blessed because of it. And then we flip the page to chapter 11, and the first four words that we read are, and the people complained. We don't even know what they're complaining about. It just says that they complained when they, when they, uh, 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 they complained of the Lord about their misfortunes. They're just complaining just to complain about everything. Right? Uh, last time I was here and we were talking, we, we went through the Exodus, right? And all the amazing, miraculous things God did for Israel. Ten plagues, the angel of death passing over the house of Israel. They heard the screams in the night. They fled the next day. They arise to the sea, the Red Sea, and they see the Egyptian army coming, and they're afraid, and they just, they cry out to Moses, did you bring us out here just to kill us? And then God miraculously splits the sea, and they walk across on dry land, only to have the army get consumed by those walls of water as it washes them away. God gave them water when they were thirsty, food when they were hungry. He was with them day and night, in cloud and in fire, constantly among his people, Yet they complained, and they groaned, and they moaned. And we get here to chapter 11, and those first four words are, and the people complained. This is the verse that really kind of consumes our, our lesson tonight, and this is God speaking to Moses. This is from verse 11. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me, and how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them and was continuing to perform before them each and every day. Complaining in and of itself is an expression of unbelief. I think we would all agree with that. Complaining about our circumstances is a lack of faith in what God has planned for us. In fact, as we go through this tonight and we see the things that Israel is actually complaining about, I want you guys to be really thinking to yourselves, you know, what are these things that I complain about? And we'll, we'll be able to have an opportunity to discuss that in a minute. We have all of these miraculous events that Egypt, I mean, we're, we're within months of all of these things happening, this exodus from Egypt. But there's this constant complaining, this constant unbelief. And eventually, as God is dealing with his people, he can only take so much until he gets angry and punishment that is involved. What's frustrating as I read through this is even as Israel is complaining about their situation, they don't go to God with their complaints. They go to Moses with their complaints, and Moses has to go to God. They know they need to go to God, but they still can't even go and face God. And this is one of the main reasons the first generation that fled Egypt in the first place doesn't get into the promised land. It was their constant unbelief, their constant and continual lack of faith. Um, I think we all know people who are just for whatever reason, just negative, pessimistic, whatever you want to call it. You know, you could say, oh man, it's a beautiful day. And their response would be, well, we can't go outside because that sun's going to cause us to have skin cancer and then we'll die, right? Just really always, and that, that type of person's exhausting, right? It's hard to, to really be friendly and courteous and welcoming and responsive when you know that person is always negative. Now take that person times 2 million and those are the complaints that God is hearing, right? We get frustrated with the one person. We try to avoid them. We try not to, to deal with it because it's just going to bring us down. Well, that's all God was hearing from the nation of Israel. And God was sustaining them, protecting them, leading them, guarding them, freeing them from slavery, claiming them to his own. In, I mean, establishing tabernacles to be in the presence of them always, yet it's never enough. It's never enough for Israel. I would argue that as we start to, we're going to look at some of these punishments and, and, and God's response to some of these. And this first one we see is that God, that pillar of fire that was guiding them by night has now turned into God's wrath. And that fire has now come down and consumed the outskirts of this camp. We don't really know what all is burned up. But the truth is God could have consumed the middle of the camp and everything that's in it and started over. He does it in a few, uh, uh, he does it with a flood here, uh, which we've already seen back in Genesis, right? God could have consumed him, but he's just, in his mercy, he rains down fire only on the outskirts of the campus, almost like a warning shot, 
stop complaining. Stop complaining. Maybe a few tents got caught up in it, some shrubs. We don't know if anybody died. I'd like to think not. This was just a warning shot across the bow. But God's anger is starting to, to come out as this constant complaining. But in his wrath, we still see his mercy. Because even in his, in his consuming of the outskirts of this camp, he didn't consume all of Israel. Right? We still see God's wrath, his mercy, even in his punishments and even in his justice. And it's, it's crazy that, that we continue to see this over and over and over again. Um, after God even consumes the outskirts of this camp, two verses later, Israel is complaining again. What are they complaining about this time? Do what? No meat. They want some food. They're hungry. They have a craving. This manna is just not satisfying my craving, God. And I, and I, I love what it says. They are remembering all the amazing food that they had in Egypt. The meat, the fish, the cucumbers, the melons, the fresh vegetables, the fruits, the leeks, the spices. We had onions and garlic powder and salt. We had all this amazing stuff. And here's the best part. It was free. It cost us nothing. It cost them everything. They were slaves to Pharaoh. They had nothing. They couldn't have bought anything if they wanted to. The least I can do for you building my nation is to feed you at night, to give you the scraps of fish that we've already eaten. You can have the tails. Yet that's what they wanted. They were tired of the manna that was physically, visibly, and literally raining from heaven. They woke up every morning to a ground covered in white. And then at night, as the moisture set in and the dew settled on the grass, it disappeared, and as soon as the dew dried, boom, more manna from heaven. An amazing sight. A daily, constant reminder that God is with you, that God is sustaining you, that God is visibly in your presence each and every morning when that sun comes up. And it still wasn't enough for Israel. They still complained, wanted more, never to be satisfied. Psalms uh, 78 describes the manna from heaven as the corn of heaven, and it also says it's the angel's food. I like that. Manna is what angels eat. If it's good enough for the heavenly bodies, it's good enough for us. And I think we all like corn. And you can do a lot of cool things with corn, right? You can cream it. You can keep it on the cob. You can broil it. You can fry it. You can whatever you want to. Corn's delicious, right? Especially when you eat it off the cob and it gets stuck in your teeth and you can eat it for a couple hours later. All that God was continuing to do for his people, day, and these are miraculous things. I mean, miraculous, unimaginable things. They read like fairy tales, but if we're here tonight, so we know their truth, yet they still had hearts set in Egypt. They were still looking back to Egypt, relishing the past, remembering what once was as they were slaves and, and captives of another nation, constantly thinking to themselves, I would rather be a slave in Egypt than a free man under God while he's taking care of me. It's crazy to me. I can't, I can't wrap my head around that. I can't. But the truth is, as I'm going through this lesson, I'm constantly thinking to myself, I'm, am I much different than that? I mean, am I not complaining about silly, insignificant things? These were major things, right? I mean, you've got to eat to live. You gotta have water to live. God's providing these things. Yeah, sure. I, I get it. Manna might get old after a couple months. I get it. But you don't have to go out and hunt for it. It's there. You don't have, you don't have it on the Sabbath, but that's God's law. That, that Sabbath, you collect enough on Saturday, you still have it on the Sunday. It's already prepared, ready to go. Like, I, I get that that could get bland over time. Maybe you have to get creative, put in casseroles. I don't know. But still, you know that. Whatever you need, God's taking care of. It might not be what you want, but it's exactly what you need, and God is going to provide that for you. And we get to verse 15, and Moses finally says he's had enough. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, that I may not see this wretchedness. This is Moses crying out to God, throwing his hands up. I'm done with these people. I don't know what else to do. They're constantly complaining. You're awesome. You're amazing. So if this is the way it's going to be, just kill me now. Just because I, I, I can't continue to do this. And I think I understand where he's coming from because as I'm reading through this, putting this lesson together, I'm getting pretty frustrated too. Like there's no excuse for their, their behavior. But God's not going to leave Moses to be there alone. He's not going to make Moses do this by himself. 
let's read a little bit more. Let's, look, start, let's go back up to verse 10. Chapter 11, verse 10. Moses heard the people weeping through their clans, everyone at the door of their tent. They're literally crying in their tents because they don't want to eat manna anymore. Crying about it. The anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give all these people? For they weep before me and say, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, then I may not see my wretchedness. God, Moses is crying out to God because he needs help. And I love how God responds. God gives Moses the help that he needs. Let's keep looking, verse, seven, uh, verse 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them uh, take their stand there with you. And I will come down and talk with you there, and I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you may not bear it yourself alone. Moses needs help, and God says, I've got help. You've got millions of people right here with you. We've got 70 good men in this crowd. Go get the elders, the people that you know to be elders, meaning the people that you know have like minds, like hearts, same vision, same faith, men that are officers that everybody recognizes as faithful followers of Yahweh. And God says, bring them to me. I will talk to you all. I will let them help you as they carry the, y'all carry this burden together. And I love what he says. He says, I'm going to take some of the spirit that is on you I'm going to put it on them, right? In the same way that God takes the spirit that was in Jesus as he was resurrected from the dead, gives that to us today. You see how Moses is pointing us to Jesus through all of this? That's why when we look back as Jesus being a Moses-like figure, these are the things that we're pulling out of it. Now, I also think it's kind of neat that, that there's 70 men that are selected. This is kind of giving us the first glimpse of what would become the Sanhedrin Council, um, the group of religious leaders in Jesus' day that were responsible for making the laws, that were responsible for enforcing the laws on the Jewish people, that made all the decisions. It was the court system of the day. And so this is, gives us our first glimpse of that order and that structure and that design that God had for his people and how the leadership was going to be structured and how this group of men would be the guys that made sure that the Jews were following the law. And so we've got a lot of really good stuff coming out of this. But I have to ask the question, what is it that you murmur about? What do you murmur about? What do you complain about? I'll, I'll go first while y'all think about it. And I think we could all probably just sit here and just list stuff, right? Uh, I'll just give you a snapshot of the last 24 hours. Um, late last night, we were playing softball, Beltline, versus the Life Point Championship game, and, and we came up a little bit short. Second place. We got a trophy. It was, it was fun. See, I'm, I'm so bad at slides, I'm not even clicking through it. Um, this is the, the defeated team. And, I, you know, I was feeling sorry for myself on my way home. Could have hit the ball a little bit better. Could have done this a little bit better. You know what the truth is? I think softball, I honestly believe softball is one of the things in my life that has put me in a position to grow in faith more than anything else. Because it was playing softball with a group of guys at this church that showed me what true men of faith look like, what husbands look like, what fathers look like. What, what, when God gives Moses these 70 people to help carry the burden of, 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 of leading people, God gave me a group of men that, that would help me carry the burden of life that I have to deal with. Some people have come and gone over the years, and some people are still playing. My little nephew sitting there in the front with the trophy, he was in the dugout every week, and he loved every minute of it. And I loved having him out there with me every minute. We lost the game, but I've gained so much more because of my, my sweet wife got us a cookie cake at the end of the game. I, I was surprised. I, got, I had no idea. She, she went out of her way to do that for us because she knows we enjoy it so much, right? All the little blessings that come from a defeat. 
It's incredible. Um, I woke up this morning, and we've got a little puppy. And I guess she was little, had a little upset stomach last night. And so we had one of those bad accidents, you know, that was real, real bad. It was just a bad accident, you know. Number two, and it was not easy to clean up kind of accidents. Y'all have been there if you've had dogs. And I was so mad. I'm trying to get ready for work, frustrated, smells awful. I mean, I got to clean the floors and do all this and that. And I'll be completely honest, that dog is amazing. I love my dog. She has brought so much joy to my family, it is almost impossible for me to explain it. She is so fun. She, she is so, I mean, she is so smart. We, she's already rolling over. It's incredible. She, she does all, can't use the bathroom outside. Frustrates me to death. I complain and I groan and I moan about it. But we have so much fun. She's so, full of so much energy. Um, she watches TV, y'all. It's hilarious. She sits there and watches TV with us. It's incredible. So it, even, even in my complaining, the truth is I'm so blessed by this silly month old puppy. Her name's Albie. She's a, a miniature golden doodle. Just incredible. I'm sitting there getting ready for work this morning, and um, I like to have my, I get caught up on my news when I'm for work, so I'm, I'm playing YouTube videos from the night before, trying to get caught up, and it, and it started buffering. I could not get the video to play because I'm just far enough away from my Wi-Fi where it either works or it doesn't, and I got really frustrated by it, really frustrated by it. Right, so I just cleaned up poop, and now my, my, my Wi-Fi is not picking up on my phone. How am I going to know what's happening in the world of politics today? I think we could all use a day off from politics, if I'm being serious. Um, but that frustrates me, right? When the truth is, I mean, the, 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 the blessings of having technology and availability and communication and being able to do all the, the things that we can do with our, our phones and having opportunities to do with our phones, I mean, those, that's a much bigger blessing than the, the 10 minutes of not being able to watch the YouTube video to get caught up on my, my Wi-Fi, on my, on my politics. Um, I had a rough day at work, man. Those phones never stopped ringing. I mean, I had to put a number on it, over 500 calls today. It just never stopped, and it is exhausting. It is absolutely exhausting. But the truth is, every call that comes in is an opportunity to bless somebody. I work in healthcare. Every call is somebody that has a physical need, and we, we have an opportunity to offer those prescriptions, get them in for appointments, to be able to answer their health care questions. I'm frustrated because it won't stop ringing and I can't get my work done, but I'm able to step into the life of someone that has a, a need medically and help. But I take that for granted because ring, 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 ring. Get caught up in the moments and it's, and it's tough. And if I'm being really honest, um, the, these are all little things, leaving the lights on, all of this stuff. But we have power and I have a home and a bed that, at the end of the day, I've been really searching myself this week, and I think the one thing I struggle with more than anything else, and I don't really know how to explain it. I think y'all will understand what I'm trying to communicate. It's hard to put into words, but um, I'm busy. I have a lot of responsibilities uh, at work and outside of work. It's overrated, being honest, but, but I do. I have very little time for, for much of anything. And the last few months of work have been really tough, and so when I get into difficult moments, dysfunks, if you will, and um, start feeling sorry for myself because I'm so over or because I have so many things that are piling on at one time, I, I start to go through my mind. I start running through these little checklists of all the good works that I do and all the good deeds that I do. And it's all not only the things that work, and it's been really tough recently, but all the things outside of work, too. Uh, it's a lot of work trying to keep the softball team organized for a Tuesday night. Like nobody wants to show up till it's time for playoffs, then it's time for playoffs and 16 people show up and I'm struggling to get 10 every other night during the week, right? Got to get lineups in at a certain time. Got to make sure we have, have balls, make sure they have bats, make sure everybody has a, a jersey, a shirt or that has a number on it and belt line on it. It's exhausting, right? Teaching class on Wednesday night, doing a men's group on Thursday night, teaching classes on Sunday. I still have to be a husband. I still have to be a father. I still have to be a son. I still have to be a leader at work. I'm a deacon at church. I do the communion, make sure everybody has their little packets every Sunday. I make sure they're all put up where they need to be at the end of service. I make sure all the, the, the monies and everything are locked up and secured, taken care of, and attendance is turned in on time so that the elders don't give us a hard time. Because those things matter, right? All these things. And I run through my checklist. And whenever I look around and I see opportunities to serve, I raise my hand and I step up. I try to take, we got neighbors that are 
physically unable to do certain things, and, and Vanessa and I and Stella, bless her heart, we, we try to our best to take care of them and water grass when they're out of town, or water plants when they're out of town. We do all those things. We invest in people, and we, we do what we need to do for our community. And, but I take all those things, and I, here's my laundry basket of filthy rags that I think means something. And I compare it to somebody else's laundry basket of things. And I make myself feel better because I think I know all the things that somebody else is doing. And it's this wicked, selfish game that I play. And it's coveting. It's thinking that I know better for my life than what God has in store for my life. But the truth is, as I'm thinking through this, I want to be called to this life. I have been baptized into Christ. This is the life that he's called us to, to lead, to love people, to serve people, to always say yes when someone has a need. I don't have time to help everybody, but if somebody has a need, I'll, I'll push one thing aside to go help because this is who I want to be. Not for me, but because that's who God wants all of us to be. And he wants us to have those kinds of hearts, those kinds of hearts for service and for people. And I take that gift, and I want to use whatever gift and opportunity and whatever God has blessed me, I want to use that for his purpose, for his kingdom. And I've turned it into some kind of sick, twisted game of self-pity to make me feel better about myself than when compared to somebody else. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no salvation in any of that. That is our response to accepting the gift of salvation that Jesus had offered us. So let me ask you the question. What do you complain about? What do you murmur about? Way too much. I, I, I could go on and on just from today. I mean, I know some of it's silly, but that's mainly the point. They're, they're complaining about manna, falling from heaven. It's silly. God's taking care of you. You're blessed. I'm so blessed. I don't deserve any of it. None of it. Yet somehow creator of the universe thinks we're worth it for him anybody have anything they want to share about their murmuring any funny puppy stories this morning go ahead mm-hmm Our, our God is so good that even in those moments, and that's what I was experiencing too, um, he loves us enough to give us that opportunity to come back to him and repent. Absolutely. Absolutely. percent. It's easy to stay in that too. that perspective where it needs to be. You know, if, if it's not enough for Israel to 
complain about their food situation still can't comprehend. They would say, you know, the food in Egypt was free. Are you kidding me? If, it, if that's not enough, Moses was having to deal with, with more. I, I, the cutest picture. She's so sweet. So soft, like velvet. Her, her, she's great. Um, turn over to chapter 12. Because if it's not enough for Moses to have to be struggling through leading the Israelites, asking for help, God giving him that opportunity, he has some struggles with his family. So we're going to read verse 1 and 2, and then I'm going to jump down and read 5 through 10. 1 and 2, and then jump down and read 5 through 10. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman, or Ethiopian woman, um, whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said... Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Skip down to verse 5. And the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward, and he said, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, not in riddles. And behold, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. When the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous like snow. And Aaron turned towards Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. All right, so Moses is dealing with all of the murmuring Complaining of the Israelites, and now his brother and sister are also complaining against him. They're upset. What, what, what do you think the motivation behind this marriage? Um, what do you think the real, real issue is with Miriam and Aaron? What is their motivation behind their complaining against Moses? Jealousy. They were jealous. Sure. sure. Right. That's a that's a really good point. You're right. I mean, that that's it. They uh, they thought they should be equal. The reality is, look, Aaron was the first high priest of Israel, chosen by God, selected by God to lead and serve the people. He was sitting alongside Moses as they were communicating with the Pharaoh uh, as the ten plagues continued to rain down on Egypt. Miriam was a prophetess, chosen and selected by God, given a unique position over Israel to help as they grew in faith and learned about Yahweh. What are they complaining about Moses for? They're, they're jealous of his position. Did, did, look at their question. Uh, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Uh, did we not remember? Moses didn't want to do this in the first place. Moses complained to God that he's not the man for the job. I don't communicate well. This is not for me. God got angry with Moses because Moses complained that he didn't want to do what God wanted to do. ...of Israel. He was selected and put in that position. To help. Yeah. Aaron's been with him every step of the way. He had some hiccups along the way, but yeah. And, and, and again, we see God's wrath. Uh, last example, God, God rained down fire on the outskirts of the camp, and now Miriam is struck with leprosy. Why Miriam? Why, why didn't Aaron get punished? Well, I, I think the clues are in the text itself and kind of how it's laid out. The, uh, I'm not an English major, so I'm going to just take the guy's word for it, but the feminine singular verb that is used here, along with Miriam's name being listed before Aaron's, gives us kind of the evidence to why she was struck with leprosy and not Aaron. She's kind of the, the, the ring leader of what's going on. And there might be some sister, um, you know, this wife's not good enough for my brother stuff going on. That's conjecture. That is not in the text. That is me stepping over here. And, but, you know, nobody's good enough for my brother kind of mindset. And so she's the one that kind of instigates this. She brings Aaron along in the sin. Isn't that funny how sin works? When you have somebody you love and you trust and they're falling into sin, they tend to bring you along with it. It's where accountability comes into play, where we have to be able to be above that and be able to call those folks back into righteousness. Um, their slander of Moses was, was unnecessary, but I think 
it speaks to that weightier issue of the heart. I think it was a heart issue of theirs, like Eric was saying. They, they assumed, they thought that Moses kind of had that same heart that they did. That's not the case. And God calls them on it. I don't, I don't speak to Moses in visions. I speak to him face to face, clearly, not in riddles, because he is a good man. He is a faithful man. You don't know what you're talking about, leprosy, right? So Aaron has to ask Moses to pray that this goes away and, and begs for God to let this leprosy leave the sister. So she goes outside of the camp for seven days. She's punished. The leprosy goes away, and she's able to come back in. Some of those laws, some of those rules were, were established in Numbers 1 through 10 as God is establishing order among the Israelites, keeping unclean things outside of a clean inner part of the camp, right? And we see examples of this, of, of very similar things throughout the text. James 3.16 says that envy is always accompanied by confusion and every evil work. Like Eric said, there's this confusion uh, that, that you think the same way that I do, and that's not the case. That, and it's evil. What, what comes out of that confusion is evil. Uh, Genesis 37, you know, when Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery because he had this real pretty coat, they were jealous because he was daddy's favorite. And they just wanted to get rid of daddy's favorite, that jealousy. And it cost them everything at the time, but the brother was able to restore them later on when the famine hit. Uh, Matthew 27, when, when Jesus is going to be crucified, you know, Pilate has this little interaction with Jesus, and he knew it was envy from the, the, the religious leaders of the day, and that, that was the reason that they plotted to kill and crucify Jesus. They were envious of his position within the Jewish community. Uh, Psalm 27, verse 4 says, Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? This is the, 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 the problem and the constant struggle of sin. Um, let's turn the page because we're kind of running out of time. Sure, as best I can. In my life, what I feel like it looks like is that as I have grown in faith, and grown in understanding of God's purpose for my life, I feel like he's revealed gifts and abilities and opportunities. And so a calling would be, to me, an opportunity to use those gifts and talents and that faith that has grown and using them to step into a role or position in the world and, and use that opportunity to influence the community around me for God's purpose. It's a tough question. I mean, I think in a sense, I think at, at a base level, as a, as a Christian, I think, I think I would say, I would argue that a calling for every Christian would be to love God and to, to love people, to serve God and to serve people. So wherever you're at in life, wherever you work, wherever you live, wherever you worship, there's opportunities within those spheres to pour out that love, to pour out that service, and to accept the calling of any Christian share the gospel, to take it to the ends of the earth. Go ahead. Uh, oh, absolutely. Okay, so calling initially is that acceptance of God's authority in our life. And the secondary role is using that authority to influence wherever we live, work, play, worship. I think there are gifts, too, that we probably all possess that are revealed to us as we, as we step out in faith and, 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 and do things for God. Those things just begin to, to miraculously just show up in our lives, you know? God doesn't have to park the Tennessee River for me to know that he's at work in my life, right? And our response to that 
be a calling, right? <laughs> I wish he'd put a little bit more fish in there. It's usually how it plays out. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Uh, go ahead. No, you're good. Right. And so you can use the revelation of what God did and you're called outside of the Great Commission to go and spread the gospel to all the nations. Right. And as long as you line up are given that opportunity and if it wasn't already true, that is our call. Yeah. Um I, that, that's a great point. I, and I, I know exactly what you're meaning because I don't really consider teaching a Wednesday night class as a calling, right? It was just a, maybe more of a gift that was revealed that, there, you know, I have an opportunity to, um, you know, talking in front of people is not a big deal. So God's able to use that to hopefully share a message one day, right? That, that's not, I'm not, not called to be a Bible teacher, but I'm happy as a Christian, as a follower of God to step into that position if that's what you need me to do, right? And, <clears throat> Absolutely. Absolutely. That's right. Let's flip over to chapter 14 real quick. We'll spend the last few minutes looking at this last example of, of uh, unbelief from the people of Israel. So we've got the constant complaining about complaining, uh, complaining about food, um, brother and sister complaining about brother, and now there's this opportunity because... Um, as God has spent the first 10 chapters preparing Israel, in spite of their complaining, God is still ready to move out from Sinai and start heading towards the land of Canaan, right? We're heading towards the promised land, and God is going to select some spies, and they're going to go and scope everything out and try to get an idea of, of what this land looks like and, and how um, they're going to be able to go in and conquer. And so for 40 days, they send out 12 spies, and they all come back, and they, they bring back amazing reports, right? A land that is overflowing with milk and honey, meaning it's extremely fertile. There's cattle everywhere. There's opportunity. It's beautiful. We'll have everything that we'll need, and we'll love every minute of it. They bring some of the fruit back that they get to enjoy, things that they've never had before, right? Complaining about the manna. Well, look at this tasty new fruit. It's going to be incredible. However... Despite all of the things that they have seen, in spite of all of the things that God has done for them, they continue to respond in unbelief. Let's read verses 1 through 4. 
Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. Here they are crying again. Crying because God's feeding them, and now they're crying because God's going to pro- give them this beautiful land with everything they'll ever need. Crying about it. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt. Here we go again. I'd rather die in Egypt than be free men under the authority of God. Or would that we had died in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Oh, it's pathetic. It is. God parted the Red Sea. Yeah, but those men are really big. God has protected you daily from everything. He has given you water when you're thirsty, food when you're hungry. I mean, an angel of death passed over you. You heard the screams. Yeah, 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 but... But their, their cities are big and their walls are really high. God, they're going to take our wives. They're going to take our children. Do terrible things to us. We'd rather die in Egypt and die in the wilderness. Let's select a new leader and go back because these are, this, this land is filled with all these tribes. There's too many of them. But two men step up and say, no, 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 no. Y'all, y'all are not seeing this right. Let's keep going. Let's look down. 7 through 11. And this is Joshua speaking. Joshua said to all the congregation of the people, The land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them. The Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones, but the glory of God appeared at the tent of the meeting of all the people of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people despise me, and how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? Right? So finally we have some men of faith, and we know Joshua's story, and we'll talk about that in the weeks to come. But Joshua stands up and says, no, 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 this land is ours. Why is the land theirs? Because God gave it to them. God is with them. He has promised it. They have seen it for themselves. God's promise of this land being amazing, overflowing with everything they need, fertile, all the cattle they could possibly imagine. It is true. They've seen it. They all report that it is true. But they're afraid of the people that inhabit that land. They're afraid of the number of people that inhabit the land. They're afraid of tall walls. They're afraid of the unknown. And Joshua says, God is with us. They can't overcome us. They're they're bread to us. We will eat them. We will devour them. But yet, what's their response? Kill him. We can't have this man speak his truth. We're afraid. Kill him. It's the only way to silence him. And again, God responds to their unbelief with wrath. And he he strikes the, the other ten spies down with a plague, and then they die. Even in God's wrath, there's mercy, because two of the spies still live. Even in God's wrath, there's mercy in the fact that all the people threatening to pick up stones to kill him didn't get struck with the same plague and didn't drop dead. These men, these, this nation of Israel just continued to be whiners and complainers. Twice tonight they've cried over and over again, let's just go back to Egypt, go back to slavery, back to Pharaoh. Do you think Pharaoh would have, would have responded well if they would have knocked on his door and said, we want to be slaves again? He probably would have killed every single one of them. Egypt was never the same after this event. Historically, never the same. It was never that great nation that it once was. That was their punishment. what they knew.
So you got to train them for a year, a few weeks, a silent day. So they're seeing all this for the first time. So if you look at the, the complement to um, insults, it's like five to one. Five good things can happen, five bad things can happen. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Two years beyond now. Yeah. yeah. It's a whole lot here beyond now. What does that mean? It's the um, it's the reality of sin on a on a basic level, right? Um, this unbelieving of even what you see in front of you because you you see other things too, and being able to process it all together causes some confusion. I like that idea of the Stockholm syndrome because it is all they've seen in the past. Um, From Genesis chapter 3, where we started, all the way forward, every miracle that we see is an example of God's love, an example of God's grace for his people and for all those who believe. And every single one of them is pointing us to Jesus, even in these numbers, right? 40 years in the wilderness, 40, um, uh, uh, when you have 12 spies that are going out, we have 12 disciples. When you have... um, what was the other 40 that we talked about earlier? The, the, the numbers and, and with Moses having the spirit that is taken out of him and put in the other man, like all of these things are continuing to point us to Jesus. All of these are benefits to us who believe and are opportunities for us to learn and grow in our faith. Um, and as we go through this and as the Bible continues to, to just reveal itself, what we have is this unraveling of God's plan for redemption because even in all of the complaining and all of the murmuring, God's plan continues to move forward, either with or without the nation of Israel. The first generation doesn't get that blessing, but the second generation does, in spite of all the things the first generation does. Eventually, God is going to, God is going to do what God is going to do, whether you're willing to come along for the ride or not. All right? And, and, and these miracles, these, these, these outward expressions of God's love and His grace, they demonstrate His, his sovereignty and His authority. Um, there are examples of his holiness and his power and his, his, everything that he has in store for us in our lives as well. Um, the judgments and the punishments that we see in the examples that we looked at tonight, um, it's not just about the sin. It's also supposed to be instructional for us. There's things we're supposed to be able to take away from this. It should point us to our responsibilities as believers. It should help us to be more accountable not only to ourselves, but to our families, to our loved ones, to our churches. Um, it, it's supposed to help us seek out uh, the secrets that God has in store for us through his word. Like Dr. Chandler was talking about tonight, like y'all were talking about here tonight. Um, it's this, this mental and spiritual relationship that we get to have with God, even in our grumbling, even in our complaining. God still continues to reveal himself, still continues to give us opportunities to, to express our faith to him. One of the most amazing things in all of the Bible that that I love more than anything else is is all the way at the end, in Revelation, at the very end times, God is still giving humanity an opportunity to repent, even as creation is being destroyed. He still loves us. It's it's incredible, right? But but it's that understanding that should give us a, a, a bigger perspective. It should give us a little bit more solid foundation to grow our faith and learn more about God want from us as, as we have been called to faith and called to, to live the life he's called us to. So, with that said, questions, thoughts? Constantly. Right. Yeah. Right. 
because you did it. That's, that's another one of the amazing things about God, that, that he, and, and, and after all of it, he still gives, gives us the opportunity to choose for ourselves when he can make every one of us fall down on our knees and worship him. Because if we're not going to do it, rocks will do it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you see it. And you see both playing out together. You see God daily. You see him working. You see the blessings. You know it. And then you're still right there along the lines, complaining, grumbling, kicking, screaming, sinning. What else? All right. I'll have a good night the rest of the week. We'll see you all Sunday. Yes, sir.